Migraines, they're brutal. Hello again, welcome to the third episode of I Teach This Time about migraines and visual aura. Hopefully you've been enjoying these clips thus far. If you haven't, I don't know what to tell you. I'll try to make them more entertaining. It's the best I can do with what I have to work with. I get migraines about two times per year. So that usually means about 24 to 48 hours of quiet time in a dark room, trying to make sure that people aren't bothering me. Uh, so I've personally experienced it many times. If you or someone you know is affected by migraines, then you know what a debilitating disorder they can be. All right, so in this video, we will cover a few different things. Um, first up is what is a migraine? A common migraine, which constitutes about 80 to 85% of migraines, is a one-sided throbbing or boring pain that can change sides, and it's associated with nausea, vomiting, fatigue, and sensitivity to sensory stimuli like light, sound, or even movement. Untreated, the headache portion could last between 4 to 72 hours, depending on the person and the headache. A classic migraine, which constitutes about 15% of migraines, has the same symptoms as a common migraine, but it also has some type of aura, whether that be visual or sensory. Like I said, aura has two forms, visual or sensory. The first one that we'll talk about is visual aura. Visual aura can be many things, but most commonly it's a flickering light, a kaleidoscope effect of colored lights in a zigzag pattern, or a blurry spot in your vision that starts relatively small and gets bigger as that visual aura timeline goes on. Sometimes it takes a more linear pattern, other times it takes a curved pattern. Sensory aura is a temporal neurological deficit that again has many forms, but the most common ones are numbness, tingling, or a low grade paralysis. Again, usually it's only on one side. The next question is who is affected by migraines? The research shows that women un unfortunately are disproportionately affected compared to men, where about 15 to 18% of women are affected compared to 6% of men. As we will allude to in a couple of minutes, there's definitely a genetic component to migraines. And there's a fair amount of research that shows over half of the people who are affected by migraine have at least one other family member who are also affected by uh, some kind of migraine or headache disorder. The average frequency of attacks per year is a one and a half per year. And the average duration of an attack is 24 hours. The next question is why do migraines occur? This is a very difficult question that a lot of people much smarter than me have devoted their time researching. Migraines are thought to be some kind of combination of genetics and neurovascular chain. It's a generally confusing topic, but to simplify it, it's worth thinking about the pain and the aura pathways as being two separate ones. The pain is thought to be a result of a system of nerve pathways that start in the dura mater of the brain meninges and work their way through the trigeminal ganglion to the trigeminal cervical complex. In short, it seems to be related to some kind of inflammatory process occurring within the brain. Confusing. Difficult to read about. The aura portion is thought to be a result of something called cortical spreading depression. Again, not that well understood, but it is a wave of reduction in blood volume that starts at the back of the brain in the occipital lobe and moves forward. Before this reduction in blood takes place, there's actually an increase in blood volume within the occipital lobe. This could explain the visual aura since our visual processing system resides in the occipital lobe. More research needs to be done to better understand the pain and the aura pathways, but that's our understanding up to this point. The next question is how are migraines treated? Now this depends patient to patient, but we'll walk through the two treatment pathways that most people take. The first pathway is preventative therapy. This would be for patients who have quite frequent uh, migraines in an attempt to decrease that frequency. The second pathway is acute therapy. This would be for patients who don't have as high a frequency of migraines, 
but want to decrease either the length of the migraine or the pain level of the migraine. In order to get treatment, you would have to seek out your family doctor. If they weren't comfortable treating migraine, then they would likely refer you to a neurologist. Now, that is not to say there's nothing you can do besides drug therapy. Many associated factors have been identified in migraines like birth control pills, pregnancy, puberty, menopause, foods with tyramine or phenylalanine, nitrates, nitrites, MSG, alcohol, fatigue, stress, or bright lights. Some of these are modifiable, others aren't. If you identify one of your migraine triggers as one of the modifiable factors, then avoidance is a treatment in and of itself. Using myself as an example, my trigger tends to be glare or bright light. To reduce their impact, I always wear sunglasses outside, and I try to wear my specs inside, especially when working on screens. The last question is why do optometrists care about migraines? Optometrists care about migraines with aura because the symptoms of aura are very similar to the symptoms that we get when we have a retinal hole or a tear or a detachment. It's very hard to distinguish the flickering lights or the change in visual field that we get with aura compared to the symptoms that we first notice with any kind of retinal issue. This means if you're someone who has just experienced their first migraine with aura, it's very important to go and get your retina checked out to ensure that it is a migraine with aura compared to one of those retinal problems that need to be treated relatively quickly. That is a quick summary about migraines and migraines with aura. If you have questions, drop them below or feel free to direct message us. As always, thanks for watching. Talk to you next time.